My name is Suzette Yasmiro Botham, and I am the lead for GBOP Diversity Channels, and I'm really excited to have all of you here this morning. Um, go Team GBOP. Um, for a very exciting conversation um, with someone, it feels like Bring My Brother to Work Day, um, but really exciting conversation with David Johns, um, who is the executive director the White House Initiative for Educational Excellence for African Americans. I did it. Go stop. All yep. right. Um, and so we're going to start with a very brief video and then get into our conversation. Hydroponics is hydroponics, which is this, which is physically grown by the ammonia of the fish. Nitrite, which turns into nitrate, and that is good for the um, fishes. It's good for the fish and the plants. And the reason why our water is green is because of the algae. So we leave it green like this until it filters out. And the good thing about this system is it's a closed system. So all we have to do is feed it. Uh, so a little bit of context. This young man, is a, uh, when I met him at the time, he was a high school senior um, at Booker T. Washington in Miami. Um, Booker T. is one of two schools that are really known uh, mostly for uh, being located near projects. Um, this one in particular is located near one that produced Trick Daddy and Trina. Um, and then sending a significant number of black boys to the NFL every year. Um, Brandon had been shot on the way to school um, earlier in the school year um, and was uh, in school on his prom day to give me a tour of his senior thesis, which was this aquaponic system that they had developed. Um, and his hypothesis was that crops grown, in particular a certain number of crops grown in this aquaponic system would yield uh, better than the uh, seeds that they planted on a portion of their football field. Um, and I try and share this for a, a couple of reasons. It's in a larger presentation, presentation which is really about the importance of, one, listening to kids, um, two, really honoring that they all have genius, right? Asa Hilliard talks about, I've never met a child, in particular a black child who was not a genius, and there's no secret to how you support them. The first thing you do is to acknowledge them as human. Um, and Brandon, in particular, attends a school that most people would like roll up their windows, lock the doors, and then just drive by as fast as possible. But through an innovative partnership with Florida International University and J.P. Morgan Chase, he has access to knowledge that literally has turned a food desert into a food forest. And he has a sophisticated understanding of agriculture that is literally transferable around the world. Right? Um, and so it, 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 he is an example of what happens when we move past a lot of the stereotypes that otherwise prevent us from showing up from young people um, and really pouring into them in ways that allow them to demonstrate just how brilliant they are. Thank you for that, David. And so I want to start by just talking about the journey, right? So something that's really important in terms of being a Googler and being Googly is understanding how people ended up where they are. Um, and I know that I've had the opportunity to hear your story several times, but you didn't know you were going to be an educator. And I don't know if any point in your life, right, like you imagine that you'd be working for the White House um, under the Obama administration. So that is amazing. But how did you get to your job and your role? Yeah, so I, three things come to mind. One, this job didn't exist five years ago. Um, it was a position that was created by President Obama uh, in part um, per the directive of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, but we now exist as one of six uh, White House initiatives that focus on filling population-specific gaps. So prior to this administration, there were White House initiatives focused on historically black colleges and universities, uh, one focused on educational access for Hispanics, another focused on educational access for Asian American and Pacific Islanders, one focused on Native American, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiians, and then one slightly different focus on faith-based and neighborhood partnerships. Uh, but if you look at a lot of the data around sort of quality of life indicators, um, uh, black people are often at the lowest rungs, particularly with regard to education and workforce development. Um, and so that was really important in terms of establishing an office so that there would be someone who was unapologetic and intentional in trying to close both opportunity gaps and achievement gaps. Um, specific to the question of uh, whether or not I saw myself A, being an educator, or B, working for this administration, the answer is hell no. Um, I'm from Inglewood, California. Um, I often joke that I didn't watch West Wing until I was well into D.C. a couple of years. Um, the idea of working in policy was not something that I thought about, um, in particular because I went to Columbia University where people are taught to take over countries and corporations, right? So the idea that I would become a teacher was something that a lot of people, including myself, uh, couldn't comprehend, right? Uh, and so the way that that happened, I think is in part just natural connections. A lot of this is grace. I took a bus ride an hour each way to and from school, from Inglewood, California to Pacific Palisades. I don't know if you guys know Southern California. 
Uh, but at each way, right, from and to Brentwood Elementary, then to Parkville Middle School, then the Pacific Palisades High School. Um, sometimes going to schools closer to Englewood, but always at some point returning back to those schools that were, you know, the promise of potential. Um, and then at Columbia, the idea was to pursue a JD PhD uh, because I like to argue, you know, when you're black and in college and you like to argue and don't want to go into medical school, they say you should be a lawyer, right? <laughs> um, and so I thought about that for a while, but um, my freshman year, somebody told me about the fact that I could pose a question and then be paid to research the answer. Um, and I thought that was the coldest hustle ever, so I was like, sign me up for that, I have lots of questions. Um, and so the thought was to really find a space where I could uh, theorize about things that vex me as a, as a person, right? Why it was that at Columbia I was one of 5% of students who attended uh, public schools, right? Particularly in California. Why I was often one of few African American males in the spaces um, that I existed in. And then in particular when I ended up teaching kindergarten on 110th Street and Broadway where there were 56 kids in kindergarten, there was not a single black boy, right? And we are less than 15 blocks away from the center of Harlem. Uh, and I watched my kids, uh, not just my kids of color, I had a couple of uh, girls of color, but like play house and the idea that they couldn't fathom a, a, a little version of me in their picture like was problematic, right? And then listening to them try and make sense of the world around them, right? Uh, one of my students, Jake, at, at some point asked me why is it that only the girls of color stay after school? Um, and then suggested it was because their mommies didn't love them. Right? Um, so watching kids make sense of the world around them and then hearing things that people were saying right, uh, in, in popular culture or, or in their homes, um, I, I struggled with that. Right? This is after sort of accepting that I'd always worked with kids but thought that I was not going to be anybody's teacher. Right? Like, just no, don't, don't want anything to do with it. But um, everything made sense for me when I found myself teaching first kindergarten and third grade. Um, and at the time, people were having lots of conversations about No Child Left Behind. Um, and so I was in grad school at the same time to sort of supplement the fact that I didn't prepare to be a teacher formally um, and knew that I needed to do more than just show up and meet my kids where they were. Um, and everybody was talking about the promise of policy. And so um, after a pretty vexing conversation in which I made a couple of classmates cry, I said that uh, policy can't be that hard. I'll move to DC and I'll fix it myself. Um, so I took a pay cut from teaching. I became a fellow with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I worked for Congressman Rangel for not quite a year, um, and then uh, joined uh, Senator Kennedy's uh, help committee staff. The help committee sees um, more than 40% of legislation introduced in any given Congress. Um, everything related to health, education, labor, pensions, and then a bunch of other things as well. Um, and I worked for him until he passed. Um, Tom Harkin uh, then inherited uh, sort of the staff um, and then over maybe two and a half years, the rise of the Tea Party sentiment made it difficult for us to have uh, bipartisan conversations in the Senate. Uh, and before I was escorted out of the building, I quit my job. Um, I drove all the way across the country to Nevada uh, and worked to get the president reelected. Um, I was then unemployed, uh, which I never thought I would say with two Ivy League degrees. Um, but shortly after the inauguration, the second inauguration for the president, um, I was then appointed to this position. Um, and in the long way of, of answering your question, I said when I was appointed that to say I have been preparing for this position my entire life is a gross understatement. Um, so while, again, clear in that I never thought that I would be an educator or working in Washington, in hindsight, all of the pieces you know, lined up. So what is the charge of your office, and how are you being tasked with helping to not only close the achievement gap, but more so the opportunity gap? Yeah, so um, my office is directed by an eight-page executive order in which the president makes us responsible for restoring the country to its right as a global leader, in part by increasing the post. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. Right? That, that's in the first, that's in the header, the lead in. Right before you even get to the, the, the numbers and stuff. So global leader in part by increasing uh, the number of African Americans to graduate uh, from post-secondary institutions. Um, and then it describes the way that we're supposed to do that, including everything from reducing segregation in schools to increasing access to early childhood education programs, uh, addressing disproportionality, increasing access to STEM and STEAM, like everything you have ever heard somebody say in relation to the challenges that uh, black students are the, the educators that support them face, it is included in our executive order. And again, mind you, we were established in the second term of this administration. Um, and because I know that there are only 254 days left in this administration, 
we chose to focus our work in, in three ways. Uh, one is giving a platform to those who are impacted by the decisions that are made in Washington to be able to talk about that experience. Right, so I get really annoyed when invited, I was just having this conversation with somebody around TFA, uh, when I get invited into spaces where the topic is about opportunities for kids and there's not a single child in the room, right? Adults, you know, reflect upon what it was like when we were in school and then we designed solutions based on the things that we think we would need. And it's so problematic. We then go into implementing the solutions that we come up with and, and seldom ask young people, what do you think about this? Right, like what matters to you? And so we have a partnership, the things that you guys have on your chair um, is, a, 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 is something we use at um, what we call AFAM Ed Summits. Uh, we host them at uh, post-secondary campuses around the country. We did one most recently at UC Davis, have done one at Laney College, UPenn, Morehouse, uh, a number of schools across the country. But the only rule for the summits is that the only experts who get to sit on the dais in front of the White House are students. Elementary age, high school, college, and non-traditional and traditional. Uh, and the one question we ask them, no matter where we are, is what do you need so that you are and feel safe, engaged, and supported? Um, who wants to guess the answer that always comes up no matter where we are or the age of the young person? Nobody wants to guess? This could be participation. Anybody want to guess? Ask the question. What's the one, what do you need so that you are and feel safe, engaged, and supported? Food. Food. What else? Good teachers. Good teachers. So she said it, it seldom comes up, but it's love, right? Um, often, you know, the things that typically are, are answered, like money, right, we need financial support, right, we need access to curriculum, like, they get to that as, at a certain point, but at the core, what they say is that we want love, right? Like, and not something that is, 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 is nebulous, um, but the love that comes from a secure attachment to an adult that you know will be there for you when you mess up, uh, when you make mistakes, um, when things don't go the way that they're supposed to go, right? Um, and so that's really important to us, is providing platforms for young people to really talk about their truth and to be celebrated for their experience. Um, the second thing we do is really highlight promising practices. Um, so we try and take away the excuse that we don't know what's working, and then also try and cut through a lot of the BS that people believe about what black kids are or are not capable of, right? Um, so an example of this is the idea that people believe that there are more black men in prison than in college, which is factually inaccurate. We question whether or not the statistic has ever been real. But I talk with people who believe that, and then they use that as a way to let themselves off the hook when they met a student that they didn't understand. Right, he's gonna end up dead or in jail anyway, so I don't need to do the work, right? And the reality is that right now there are more than 800,000 black men on college campuses than there are in prison. We're still disproportionately represented in prison, right? But in spite of the challenges, we still show up and try, not only try, but show out in spaces that we're not often uh, supported in. Uh, and so we leverage things like um, Twitter, we host by monthly Twitter chats. Um, on Thursdays, 12 to 1 Eastern Standard Time, where we pick a topic and invite people to talk about it, um, in part because African Americans are oversubscribed on social media, including Twitter. Um, so we like to slide into the DMs and disrupt whatever they're doing. <laughs> uh, and, and otherwise find ways to make critical connections between, um, again, things that, 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 that might not be accessible because they're coded in jargon, right? Whether that's the tech speak, like Google, all these, the Google acronyms, um, <laughs> right? Or policy speak, right, that the walks in DC understand. Um, and then the third thing is supporting organizations and individuals who do that work, right? So um, I'm here in part because on Monday, I gave a keynote at the um, Oakland Unified School District's African American Male Achievement Program. Um, and that was the first program that any senior um, leader from the administration visited after President Obama launched the My Brother's Keeper Initiative. Right, on Friday, tomorrow I guess, I will be at Chabot College for the Striving Black Brothers Commencement Program. Um, again, two organizations that do the work um, that makes all of what's theorized in my executive order very real. Um, and because there is so little time left in this administration, right, every day I watch the video of the young girl who's told that the president is leaving at a certain point and she just wilds out. <laughs> that's how I feel. Um, because that, that clock is um, ever present in my mind, um, so much of our work is connecting with those who have done the work before this administration and will be charged with continuing it after. Um, so I want to go back to something that you said in terms of social media, right? Um, and we are, of course, Google, and so technology is a very important part of uh, moving the work and the ball forward um, for our children. Um, and people can't see your shirt, 
but it says hashtag teach the babies. Um, and that's probably how I met you. People keep asking us how we met, and I, I can't really give them a good story yet. But I know that a lot of um, influence comes from social media um, in terms of building understanding and awareness. Social media was also the birthplace um, for the Black Lives Matter movement. And so how are you leveraging social media to build more awareness um, and advocacy for the work that you're doing? Yeah, um, social media has been a really important tool for us, um, in part because we don't have the resources that, for example, the president has. Um, and so we expended quite a bit of energy early on when the initiative was established, essentially establishing profiles, right, in spaces where we knew we could engage with and otherwise give information to what we call our stakeholders, right? And I tell my, my, my team that right when we think of who we do our work for, it's really for people like my mom, right? I'm a first generation college graduate, so I always think of, you know, your friend who graduated from college, but their mom who may may have just finished high school, right? Like our content has to be appropriate for them to be able to understand it and digest it in ways that don't make them confused or otherwise feel like they don't know enough to be able to engage in this space. Right? And so um, social media in particular, Instagram and Twitter, allow us to provide content in ways that are extremely easily digestible, right? So an example is we have a partnership with the Because of Them We Can um, campaign, right? There's another video. I carry this notebook. Um, I carry a backpack. Uh, one of my favorite things to do in schools is to ask teachers uh, to name the people on this notepad or on the backpack. Um, and surprisingly, most often adults can't. Right? It's like 10 people, and that's the people we sometimes celebrate in February. Right? And if you think about the fact that teachers can't do it, we shouldn't be surprised when students then can't do it. Right? Um, and so in February, for example, we uh, posted an image of, again, these heroes and sheroes that we celebrate sometimes from our future, but sometimes from present as well, and then created easily digestible activities for parents and families to do, right? tell a story, create a poem, sing a song, right? just find ways to make meaningful connections. Um, I have a lot of fun on Twitter. I think less now, uh, maybe because I'm becoming old. Um, but one of my favorite things to do uh, was to be disruptive during like TGIT when everybody was watching Scandal. I don't watch Scandal anymore, but I used to be really into Scandal. Um, but I would get a lot of traction by saying things like, I know you broke all kind of laws to get home, to get your wine, to be a gladiator, but did you read to your kids tonight? Right? So just finding ways to interrupt spaces where sometimes these conversations don't happen, right? And then we think about you know, working with Glee, for example, um, on a story arc that included an acknowledgment of homeless children, right? So there's you know, the Elementary Secondary Education Act that was just recently reauthorized into ESSA, the Every Students Achieve Act. Uh, Title 10 of the previous bill was McKinney-Vento, uh, policies governing just laws and regulations around kids who are homeless, right? Um, there was a student who, for a second on Glee, was homeless, and they mentioned the McKinney-Vento Act, right? Uh, it was a way for us to talk about something that is seldom discussed outside of Washington, D.C. I'm sure most of y'all have never heard of McKinney-Vento or haven't thought about the fact that there are laws governing things related to homeless students. Uh, but again, that's a, an opportunity of ways that we make connections to try and change things. One more I'll offer. Um, a colleague, Natoki Ford, who works on Office of Science and Technology Policy, has a social media and media um, a project that is essentially around leveraging uh, popular culture and media to highlight opportunities for minorities, in particular African Americans, in STEM. Right. So when you think about how many of you guys watch CIS, no, I watch CIS <laughs> um, and a lot of Ratchet TV too. Um, but you know, there's data around the increase in the number of students who declare majors related to forensic sciences and things that are connected to CIS. And so the idea is that if we can take that, draw clear connections and compel other people to make meaningful connections, we can otherwise accelerate opportunities, right? If you look at Blackish, there's been a similar arc where um, Yada's character um, has had a lot of, of, of work in projects around physics, right? That's an intentional connection to get us to think about things that otherwise exist as amorphous because, you know, sometimes if black folks are credentialed, them being a STEM engineer isn't celebrated in the same way. Um, so we just try and be disruptive, and social media is a tool that helps us. So let's talk about synergies, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of um, what I keep hearing in um, your replies is like the synergies between technology and the synergies between our communities and the synergies between even things like social media. What synergies are we missing between the education world and technology world that would make this a different place for our kids? Good question. Um, I think three things. Um, 
one, we miss opportunities to make things plain, right? So I often say that everything you need to know you learned in kindergarten. Um, and there's a certain point when we, we become adults where I think the goal is to make things complicated, right? An example of that is that adults argue about STEM versus STEAM, right? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics versus science, technology, engineering, the arts and agriculture are mathematics. And what I say is, I've never been in a classroom where students have ever said, stop! Is this the T or the A? <laughs> right? Like, where, where the acronym does? They just want to be engaged, right? They don't really care about the jargon or the ways that we talk about things or, 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 or create silos in spaces where they don't exist, right? Um, and so I think the first thing is that Google, Googlers, the, all of y'all, whatever acronyms you b belong to, um, should think about ways to make um, things simple and uh, things that are often rendered invisible made plain, right? So for example, um, a lot of young kids are told that they aren't science-minded, that they can't be an engineer, in part because it was difficult for the adults around them, right? Like think about how many times you've heard somebody say, math was hard for me, so it's going to be impossible for you, right? Or I never got that, so you're not going to get it either. Or the reality that some of y'all have experienced, I'm thinking about the women in this room in particular, right, that the spaces you occupy, you're often alone or isolated, and you just don't want anybody else to have to endure that struggle, right? Um, and so we end up killing the dreams of young people before they ever start to think about the possibilities that exist for them in spaces like this, right? Uh, the second thing is related to the jargon, right? Uh, we don't often develop the vocabularies of young people so that they can talk about the stuff that happens in these spaces using the terms that actually exist, right? Um, we talk a lot at the initiative about the importance of using actual terms to describe everyday phenomenon so that kids can develop vocabulary before, again, they're told that they can't. Right? So that's everything from the way that you observe science in the natural world right, to the connections that you guys would, 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 would make because of the things that you've studied. Um, and then I think the third thing is just sort of showing up. I uh, spend a lot of time now with young people who say they want to be engineers. Um, and then I ask them, what does that mean? And then they don't know. Right? Um, it, it's almost like you know, STEM is the new green jobs, where everybody's talking about it, but very few people know exactly what it means. Right? So the question for you for me is like, how do you make your job visible to young people who are observing you? I mean, particular young people who are observing you and you're not even aware of it, right? Like, how do you show up, at, whether you're an engineer or you support engineering functions or whatever it is that you do, in ways that just make it accessible for young people? Does that answer your question? It, that was perfect. Of course. Um, so, I hear a lot of myth busting in your job role, right? Like you're constantly going out finding the myth and then disproving it. What's the biggest myth about our kids? And what do we need to be thinking about in terms of turning that around for them? I, I'm gonna invert that, because uh, I try not to do the deficit thing, so I don't wanna reaffirm uh, deficits. Uh, the thing that uh, keeps me up at night uh, is the reality that um, in too many communities throughout our country, a child's access to opportunity is predicated by code, right? genetic code or zip code. Um, and I know, in part because I meet kids every day that show up in the way that I just described, that Asa Hillier talks about, like, every child is a genius. I've never met a child who asked to be birthed, right? Um, and the ones who are most sensitive to the fact that the environments that they're forced to endure aren't conducive to their well-being um, are the ones who deserve our love and support the most, right? Uh, and so what am I saying? One, uh, we often neglect and ignore the kids who are most deserving of our time and attention. Um, and I'm not just saying sort of formal educators, but I mean the way in which we also show up as mentors, our sources of support for young people that inhabit the spaces we move through, right? Um, two, we miss the fact that young kids right now face challenges, sometimes on the way to and from school, that would break the average adult. Right? Um, there was a moment when Mike Brown died and we went with um, the last Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, to Ferguson. And there were adults who for the first time were thinking like, oh, this is really traumatic. These kids are experiencing death for the first time. And the kids are like, this is the third friend I done lost this school year. Right? Like, and, and there was a, if I remember correctly, Mike Brown was killed maybe on a Thursday. The kids were out of school almost for an entire week. Right? And they were told during this break, not to talk about it, right? And the reality was that that's all they were doing, 
they were group chatting and snapping and and Facebooking like and they, and they came to school ready to have the conversations in real time that they had been having virtually. And the adults who kid, you know, kid kid themselves into thinking that they weren't going to talk about it or just be at home doing whatever I think people think the kids do now, just crazy, right? <laughs> um, and so I think we miss that, right? The, the the literal challenges that kids face trying to show up and do the things that that we demand of them. And then the third thing is we miss unique opportunities to address specific challenges, right? Uh, so the President Lodge My Brother's Keeper as an initiative to highlight the fact that we often are numb to the challenges that boys and men of color in particular face. The initiative received a lot of criticism in part from uh, black feminist groups that suggested that the theory that we're going to fix things by focusing on black men and boys was false, right? That if we're going to do anything, we need to focus on black women and girls. And the problem with this is that both are true at the same time, right? Um, there's a data point now that a lot of people are familiar with, and it's that for every one white male who's suspended or expelled in K-12, it's three times that rate for black men and boys. Right? The thing that most people miss now is that that rate is six times as high for black women and girls. Right? And in major metropolitan spaces like Atlanta, Georgia, Oakland, California, black women and girls are being pushed out of schools in their homes and being pulled into things like sex trafficking. <coughs> the highest rates exist in Atlanta. Right? And that nuance is missed if you look at sort of the top lines, right? The top lines are nationally in the aggregate, women are doing well, and they are, right? Black women in particular continue to outstrip black men proportionately, right? However, for high-performing black women and girls, as well as for those who are academically challenged, they face a lot of social challenges that are missed unless we talk about the nuances, right? Similarly, there are unique challenges that boys and men of color face, right? I think about what it was like to be followed by a cop leaving the airport, then driving past Fruitvale Station, right? There are just things that come with our lived experience that sometimes go missed and unnoticed. The last thing I'll say about this is that sometimes we don't even think about the trauma that's inflicted upon children, right? Like, we debate sometimes in social media whether or not black lives matter, right? And there are students who hear that question and then go into spaces where people affirm for them whether or not it does or doesn't, right? Their humanity, whether or not it, it matters, whether or not it's of, of consequence, right? And when we don't think about the social and emotional health and well-being of our kids, sometimes it becomes too much about like their cognitive growth and how well they're doing on you know, computer science assessments or if they're ready for the AP. When we miss the social and emotional piece, right? The, the, the importance of mental health, we, we do everyone a, a huge disservice. So then what are five concrete things? And I'll give you a range. Okay. Give me three to five. <laughs> concrete things that each of us can do to be asset-based and asset-focused in terms of supporting not only our schools, because we know the unit of change is actually the school building yeah. in school communities. Who interesting. Uh, let, I'm going to back into this by highlighting the policy areas that have been most important in terms of our work and then try and make some direct connections to, to the group. Um, so the areas where we focused our, um, our attention, and when I say our, I'm referring not only to the initiative that I run, but our work is supported by a President's Advisory Commission of some 27 folks, including Freema Rabowski, who is president of UMBC, runs the Meyerhoff Scholars Program gets a whole lot of minority folks into MD-PhD programs. They focus their efforts in three areas. One is increasing access to high quality early learning programs, right? Um, so the thing that's important here is that learning starts at birth, but the preparation for learning starts well before birth. And we spend a whole lot of time, in particular in the African American community, talking about school at beginning in kindergarten, right, or playing catch up thereafter. Um, and the data shows that African American students are most likely to be enrolled somewhere, right, whether that's child care, Head Start, Early Head Start, or some other pre-K program, but the quality is always questionable, right? The very opposite is true for our Latino brothers and sisters, and I'm acknowledging that some of us exist in the intersections and are Afro-Latino and other derivations thereof. Um, but for the Hispanic community more generally, the tendency is for the babies to be in what we call FF and family, friend, and neighbor care. But when they are enrolled in a program, it's of high quality, right? So we have to do the work of both increasing the number of black babies and families that are in high quality early learning programs, but then improving the quality of those at the same time, right? So if y'all know somebody that has a child who's under five, ask them are they enrolled in a high quality early care and education program. 
right? And if not, there are resources, there are child care resource referral agencies, there's Thrive by Five, there are all kinds of things in particular in California that you can refer them to to help connect that dot. The second area that we focused on is increasing access to meaningful pre-K-12 curriculum, including by focusing on STEM and STEAM. Right, so what does this mean for us? One, access to computer science, right, as a basic right, prerequisite. We know that there are seven states in this uh, country where you cannot take a computer science course at all, right? And then uh, access is also disproportionate in spaces where um, one can take a, um, a computer science course. Um, and so in addition to talking about access to curriculum, we're working at a federal level to increase the support for public institutions or institutions that lever leverage public resources to provide meaningful experiential opportunities for kids to learn STEM skills, right? So sometimes that looks like, you guys might know, upper bound programs or um, things that traditionally cost a whole lot of money um, and are reserved for really privileged people. Um, so that's the second area. The third area is increasing uh, college graduation or completion. And when we say college, we mean specifically two and four year institutions, right? Credential, certificate, or degrees of value. Um, and we focus uh, specifically, bless you, on reducing the need for and time spent in developmental or remedial ed. Right, so some more than 60% of African Americans who begin a post-secondary program don't finish because they get stuck in developmental education or non-credit bearing coursework. Um, and so we work with institutions or systems like the University of Texas to try and change that. So those are three sort of policy programmatic areas that I think are worthy of additional consideration. Um, but there are two things that I think everybody can do no matter how you show up in this. One is to support the learning and development of a young person. Right? Um, so I often say the first thing to think about is teaching. Right? Um, we often don't think about that. Um, but teaching, people say silly things like teaching isn't rocket science. They're right, it's a lot harder. <laughs> I have a NASA scientist who confers with that. Um, and so if you can't teach, you can mentor. Right? And you can do that in groups. You can do it with other people so that you find ways to hold yourself accountable. But showing up in the lives of young people um, is critically important. Uh, and then the second thing related to that is just to listen to young people, right? Really give them opportunities to talk about what's going on in their world and then to enroll you in the process of supporting them, right? Like how often have you brought a young person just to this campus to imagine what life could be like if they continue to do the things that they're asked to do, right? Uh, we sometimes go back to, I went to Columbia, so we don't really tailgate there, but I know some of y'all go to schools where they tailgate, right? Go Gators. You turn up for the party, right? But do you take young people with you to again say, imagine what life could be like for you if you again do the things that sometimes can be difficult to do because life gets in the way. I think that's five. I, I mean, you hit the mark. Okay. <laughs> I'm not disappointed. Okay. Um, so let's go back to David the man and David the journey. So everybody who knows me knows I will toot your horn for you if you won't toot your own horn. Um, you were recently named a young alum um, of VALA and distinction for Columbia University. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm, we know that the administration is coming to an end mm -hmm, um, pretty mm -hmm, soon. Mm -hmm. um, what are you thinking about in terms of just your continued trajectory within the space? Um, and where might David be in the next five to 10 years? I don't know, but I know that uh, for three months after January 20th, 2017, David will be somewhere on a beach where there's no, <laughs> no cell phone reception, no Twitter, no Instagram, no nothing. Uh, you realize that doesn't work for me, though. I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is, uh, people laugh, but I'm so serious. Um, I, for two reasons. One, um, again, this job didn't exist when I was an undergrad, and I had to move through the process of, you know, I was a kid who had like a, the plan A and then like the backup plan just to make sure the plan A happened, and then another one just in case that one didn't go through. Um, I long let go of that and really um, abide by the importance of walking by faith, right? So much of my. Um, what I'm now um, um, celebrated for, which is still weird, even when people read my bio, I'm like, oh, that's kind of crazy. Um, so much of what I've done is simply show up and find ways to leverage my uh, privilege um, and purpose to do better for others, right? Um, and so I don't really know what I will do in terms of employment. I will likely be unemployed. I'm okay with that. Got a good accountant. Um, <laughs> 
But it's really important for me to take a break, right? I took this job knowing that I could run as fast as possible for you know a, a defined number of, of days. There are 253 left. Um, and then at that point, take a break, um, in part because this work is all consuming. Right, to do the work of advocating on behalf of children who are often neglected and ignored is crazy making. Um, um, I often have to travel and engage with and visit with young people to be reminded that the work is important. Because right? when you sit with adults who um, don't understand that somebody invested in them and, the, and that they, they, other kids need the same support, um, it can sometimes um, drain you in ways that, that, if you're not thoughtful of, can make it difficult, if possible at all, to do the work. Um, so I'm not trying to be funny or flippant, uh, but I'm taking a break, a real break. I need you to have You'll cell be phone right, reception. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, so awesome, and how do we find you on social media? I am at Miss David Johns on everything, uh, and then use the hashtag Teach the Babies. <laughs> Hello, hello everyone. I'm Greg Hammonds and I'm with the Accounting and Compliance team. Uh, thanks so much for coming, David. Just have a question about, like you said, you're gonna go and take a break, the well-deserved uh, you know, um, trip. And so I just wonder, as far as the initiative, yep. what's happening, you know, like is it gonna continue, who's taking your place, or what can we expect? Yep, good question. So the precedent is that the initiatives continue regardless of the political party in power. Right, so the HBCU initiative, the eldest of them was established under Carter and has continued via executive order since then. And the expectation is that this one will continue as well. Um, I spent probably 90% of my time on the road in part um, supporting stakeholders um, that should anybody ever attempt to even try and change something significant, there'll be lots of pushback, um, not only from the Black Caucus, but from the community as well. Um, and there's a deputy director, a young woman, she's a PhD student at the University of Virginia, um, who's on staff now, who's being groomed to take over when I get to take a break. You know, so there are a lot of African American students that are in these predominantly majority school districts. Yep. What sort of work is being done for that population? Because I do feel like that population gets, tends to be forgotten where we're you know, definitely focusing in areas that are obviously very critical, but what are we doing to support those students? particularly in a place like California where there's a lot of suicides that are happening in districts that are very close to this location here um, in Sunnyvale. Just curious to see if you've you know, been focused on this issue at all in your work. Yes, uh, so really important, uh, three things. One, I talk a lot about the HBCU initiative uh, in part because our executive order includes language that is essentially mandates that we supplement, not supplant their efforts. Um, and so this is a really important nuance because often when people think about black students in post-secondary spaces, they think about historically black colleges and universities, and they provide an essential service to our country and community, but 90% of black kids in college are at white schools, right? Um, and so we exist in part because we need to focus on all of the places where black students are learning and or people are entrusted with their learning and development, um, and highlighting that is, is, is one of them, right? Um, the second thing, um, I think, I guess is two. One is focusing on curriculum expansion, right? So another thing that comes up at a lot of our summits is the need for everybody, not just students of color, but for everybody to be more aware of the contributions that African descendants have made um, to American history, to global history. And so we're working now with the College Board to create an AP exam in African American history because we know that which is tested is taught. Um, and that'll be a way for us to be more thoughtful and expansive in how it is that we educate everybody and celebrate the fact that when things are diverse, we all win. This is also um, directly related to the fact that there are a couple of states in the South in particular that are now forcing educators to teach things like Confederate history, which would make a lot of the challenges that we're working through now related to the Black Lives Matter stuff more complicated, right? Specific to the question of mental health, uh, we have a number of partnerships, including with Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, the greatest fraternity known to man. <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> Listen, Linda, uh, uh, to focus on mental health, right? So what we know is that the number of suicide rates for black boys in particular, right, school-aged has doubled in the last 20 years. And so while we spent a lot of time focused on, right, we spent a lot of time focused on state-sanctioned state violence, we're missing the fact that uh, we're not, again, addressing the mental health needs of our children. And so we partner with not only Cap Abbasai, but Susan Taylor's Cares Mentoring to talk about the role of toxic stress, trauma 
and prolonged exposure to poverty, um, and really drawing the connections between those physiological things that sometimes are discussed in health spaces and their implications in um, in education more formally. Um, so a lot of it for us right now is uh, not only gap filling, but then highlighting where we need to be focusing more attention, and that is obviously one of them. So my question is, you actually just touched on it. I was wondering about the ramifications you've seen thus far. I mean, it's only been one term, but as you were talking about mental health, I'm just wondering about the work that your office might be doing with the US Public Health Service, um, just in regards to things like access and education, because we've seen that in this country, uh, your income is, your health outcomes are most directly influenced by your income, but we see that that doesn't apply to minority communities. Right. So you have instances of where white high school dropout females have better birth outcomes than college educated black women, right. when in fact it should be the opposite. Right. How, what kind of work, or is there any work being done between your office and that initiative and the US Public Health Services in regards to tackling economic Okay. I got you. Racial and ethnic uh -huh. um, health disparities that are being directly influenced by economics, poverty, um, continued uh, exposure to, like you're saying, stress, you know, having to, as we always say, work twice as hard to get half as much. Like yep. all of those things have real physical consequences. Yep. Are you seeing um, any major strides being made in terms of looking at the physical health of our communities as a direct outcome of the work that you all are doing? Uh, yes, uh, and I uh, try and take my ego out of it. I don't know how much of it is a direct uh, uh, relation or it is correlated to things that we've done specifically, but I think a lot of it just has to do with federal movement around healthcare, right? So remember, first term of this administration, everybody expended energy to get the Affordable Care Act passed, um, in part because we use a lot of that money Money, um, that was saved from uh, taking back the loan service provision that banks did so that the federal government can do it from direct lending. I know some of y'all were impacted by this and got a little bit more money in your bank accounts, right? Uh, but this was in part because we were also able to highlight the role that schools and institutions could play in addressing the health challenges of communities in particular that don't access traditional forms of care, right? So there are three things that come up for us. One is highlighting the role that um, navigators play and connecting communities that traditionally are leery of or untrusting of um, health care providers so that they can access care, in particular preventative care. Um, two, we spend a lot of time highlighting the benefits of the Affordable Care Act and the need for families, in particular our communities, to take advantage of them. One, the benefits that were afforded to women, in particular around prenatal care and health, and then two, the benefits that were afforded to children who might not have previously been able to get coverage because they had uh, a condition. Right? that would have made them excluded under the previous health care laws. The third thing, and this goes back to the question you just asked, uh, the two things that we spend a lot of time talking about with our stakeholders, with our communities, are one, the need for us to move beyond celebrating resilience, right? Um, so this is a personal thing for me. Um, um, and the first lady does a wonderful job of highlighting the work required for young people, um, in particular in communities like mine in Inglewood, California, to show up be, and be successful in spite of, right? But the question I'm now asking, and this just came up when we were at AERA, the American Association of Education Research, is at what cost? Right, so to go back to Scandal and the line that you just mentioned, second season of Scandal opened with Liv being in an airport hangar with Papa Pope. And he said to her, what's the one thing I always taught you growing up? And she couldn't even look him in the eye and said, I have to work twice as hard just to get half as far, right? And it was like the thing heard around the world. Like what person of color hasn't heard that in some way, shape, or form, if not multiple times over their lifetime? And the question for me is, but at what cost, right? Mentally, physically, emotionally, psychologically, like what is the toll of you always showing up in spite of and, and, and what does it do to young people? And so we're now working with a couple of institutions, including the Urban Institute, to develop a research agenda so that we actually have data to move past the anecdotal. Uh, but if nothing else, I highlight the fact that it's happening and that we need to be mindful of it with regard to supporting our kids, right? This came up at the AAMA celebration of Full Acts Gospel, right? A lot of what they did was say to kids like, y'all just need to keep going to school and doing well, right? Y'all just need to keep going and, and, and reading these books, right? And, and, and that's, that's true. But adults also have a responsibility, right, to change the institution so that they're, they're, they're welcoming, that they're supportive, right, but also to address things that often go um, unacknowledged, which is, again, the, the implications of having to do the kind of work that happens when we don't make these connections. Teachers of color and school leaders of color, um, what, how your work kind of touches that or what you guys are looking 
to so how to, how to support those. Yep. Those teachers. Um, so uh, th that comes up often. Uh, the thing that we talk most about is the need to address diversity within the workforce. Right. Um, less than two percent of the teaching workforce looks like me. Um, and especially at the earliest levels, right? Like the fact that I was a black man teacher in kindergarten was just crazy. Um, in part because uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done socially. People still think that the work is feminized and that men who are interested in it um, or the pedophiles are just socially awkward, right? Which I try and refute every day. <laughs> uh, uh, so that's one. <laughs> um, but then the second thing is really to highlight the importance of it, right? So Freeman Robowski talks about the fact that educators do God's work, right? But we live in a society that does not value that in the same way, right? And then when people try and find creative approaches to doing that, think about the districts that have been paying educators is more than six figures and all these other things, people get criticized for it, right? Um, and so what we try to do is address that by one, highlighting the role that African American educators who are already in the field play, hey, um, <laughs> already in the field play, right? The, the importance of doing this work too, talking to young kids, right? I say to them, educators do God's work. You need to think about teaching. I did this talk at Howard, right? Where I was like, my goal is to get y'all to think about, right? Uh, also did it at Morehouse as well. Yeah. Okay, see, I didn't do it at Spelman, but it was right across the, camp, the campus. You didn't gotta have it. See about the sauce and stuff. And see. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but again, going to these spaces and talking about the importance of doing this work, and again, acknowledging that teaching isn't for everybody, but we should all consider the ways in which we can show up. And then practically thinking about the ways that the federal government can be helpful or supportive. So there was just a week ago, I actually, maybe it was this. No, last Monday there was a convening around diversity in the workforce where we leveraged data around recruitment, retention, and advancement of um, a diverse workforce. And I mean diverse in every sense of the word, right? Not, not just black, I'm talking about able bodied, not able bodied, uh, LGBTQ, like every form of diversity. Um, in part because the thing that I always think about is um, we have this screening and um, discussion series of partnership with Most Picture Association of America and Aspire. Again, show up in places where people are. We show films that are only positive in relation to how we can support our kids, right? Things like The Inevitable Defeat of Mr. and Pete, a wonderful film that you all should see about the resilience of um, black children and what it means for us to think that they're not capable of succeeding in school when they succeed in life sometimes by themselves. The film that we're showing in two weeks is three and a half minutes. It's the film about Jordan Davis who was murdered in a gas station. Um, and Lucy McBath, his mom and I had this discussion on an Essence panel where she sat next to my mom and said that she knew when the police called and told her what transpired, that, 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 that it happened in that way, that, that, that somebody said to her son, you can't do something, and he said, the hell with that, I'm gonna do it anyway, right? Because she raised him to advocate for himself. But the, the thing that I will go to my grave fearing and knowing is that if Michael Dunn, the man who shot Jordan Davis, had a black male teacher, at some point in his life, who, who he saw like conspire for his success, who he felt loved him in ways that were authentic, that, that altercation would have happened differently, right? And so sometimes the conversation around diversity becomes very one dimensional and, and it's often like black kids need to see black people. That's important too. Right, like we all need to see versions of ourselves reflected in the world around us, but 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 the more important thing is to see people who don't look like us who conspire for our success, right? Like that, that that's why the, the work is really important. So we try and highlight that now and then work with organizations um, that are doing that work. My question is what can we do, like right now? I got some projects y'all can invest in. No, let me stop. <laughs> I'm serious, let's talk about that offline. Um, what can you do now? One, find two young people to carry with you along the way, right? Uh, and one should be so that the natural, like the young person that you probably now just conjured up in your mind because they do like backflips down the library stacks on Saturday, right? <laughs> uh, but the other one should be one that challenges you, right? One that you want to shake, right? Um, in part because it'll be that one which will keep you honest in doing the work required to show up for a young person. And, and, and when you make the commitment, uh, make it knowing that you have to be honest um, in particular around the failures that have allowed you to be successful, right? There's something else that happens, I think, for adults where we become successful in whatever the hell that means, and then we don't talk about the challenging moments. And so when it happens for young people, they think that they're the only one who ever has to deal with it, right? This is in part why in June of this year we're hosting for the first time ever a White House summit on black LGBTQ students, right? Y'all aren't alone. 
Y'all been showing up and showing out for decades, and, and, and we need to be mindful of what's required to create environments in which you can not only exist, but thrive, right? The very opposite of uh, addressing the challenges that go uh, when, when we don't talk about toxic stress or our, our health implications. So find two young people to carry with you. The second, find ways to um, make very transparent and real the world that you exist in for those around you. Right, so like this space is hollow ground for, for most folks, right? People think Google, they think y'all got like helicopters flying around and <laughs> robots delivering stuff, right? People don't know what's going on here, right? And, and so the question is, how do you share the magic, like the thing that keeps you here for all of the hours that y'all are here, all this food y'all consume, like, <laughs> how do you share that with people in ways that will help them make meaningful connections? Practical example, we were in Atlanta at a STEM high school and asked an auditorium of kids, how many of you know a STEM professional? Two kids raised their hands. Two, at a STEM high school. We then said, how many of you know somebody that does hair? 20 of them raised their hand. How many know somebody that owns a business where they clean something, right, industrial or otherwise? A couple, right, like the, the, the lesson for me there was that we had to make real the things that are often rendered invisible when we talk about credentials and jargon in ways that, you know, obfuscate the fact that people show up, they make innovation, they, they do things, right? So how do you take the world that you exist in and sometimes take for granted? How do you share your privilege is the simple way. Of, of putting it, right? Because all of us have it, the fact that we're sitting here right now having this conversation is an indication of that. So how do you share that with someone, right? And in particular, when you think about um, the workforce implications of this, the work that uh, Deebop, what's y'all's name? Gbop. Gbop. I'm about it, by the end of the day. When you think about the work that, that Gbop does, right? Like how do you unlock the hidden curriculum, right? The, the, like the, even the fact, we were just laughing about this, like, Suzette said, don't walk up in here in a suit. Right? Like, that's meaningful in a space like this, because y'all would have might have thought that I was crazy. It would have been a fly suit, but I'm saying, like, it doesn't work in this space. So, like, how did you unlock the hidden curriculum in ways that, that make the, the connections meaningful, right? And then I think the third thing is to 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 to, to be intentional about finding ways for each of you to have uncomfortable conversations. So I appreciate that, that this room is diverse, right? Like I, I, I don't appreciate sometimes that, you know, we have like, it's just black folks that want to show up and talk about like black kid issues, right? One thing that I struggle with taking this job, right? Do I want to be the black man appointed by the black president working on things just for black kids, right? And the implications are larger, right? In part because we live in a, a really diverse society. And so I'm asking each of you to not leave all of this here. Right? Um, we could have had an entirely uh, separate but related talk just about the intersections of race and racism and, 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 and power and privilege, right? Um, a lot of, to your, to your question about pathways, why I'm here um, is because I was at a very privileged institution um, that was struggling with you know, uh, lack of civility as a result of people being really ignorant and privileged. My senior year at Columbia, um, I, my classmates showed their asses. They were an anti-affirmative action bake sale that started at UC Berkeley and then migrated its way to the East Coast. Um, there was a marching band that aimed to be offensive and put up flyers. Like one had Michael Jackson as a black boy, then as a white woman, and it said, who needs ethnic studies? When there had been a hunger strike that was on campus for the 30 days prior to that, um, um, the Federalist paper published a cartoon um, starring, or uh, called Blackie Fun Whitey, starring Kunta Krenius and Steppen. Um, that said black people were invented in the 1700s as a cheap form of labor, parodied all of our contributions through sports and entertainment, and then said, don't worry, black people do lots of other wacky things, but you don't have to worry about that until next Black History Month. This was in 2004, right, at Columbia University in the middle of New York, right, where, where, where again, the, the consequences of us refusing to do the uncomfortable work of talking about race and racism and privilege and ignorance um, continues to show up and it often shows up in really devastating ways in the lives of young people, right, who don't have the privilege to take themselves out of certain spaces or to be protected because they live in a certain community or can't associate with a certain community. So I'm asking you to do that work, right, to really talk about the things that can often go unstated when you're just focusing on the technology. Right? And to really think about how it is that you leverage the privilege that exists, not only in each of you individually, but in this institution, to make some, some of these meaningful connections for the children who you should be preparing to take your seats in a not so distant future. Thanks.